Dear Church, let's talk about the Sermon on the Mount. You know what this is? No, it's a line. At least that's what a zoo in China attempted to fool people into believing. When the real line was sent away to a breeding center, a Tibetan Mastiff dog was placed in the cage as a substitute. The fraud came to light when a mother wanted to show her son the different sounds that animals make, and when they got to the cage marked African Lion, they were shocked to hear it bark. Apparently, this is not the only incident of mislabeling. There was also a white fox in a leopard's den, as well as another dog being passed off as a wolf. You know, things are not always as they seem. That's something Jesus alluded to in his famous Sermon on the Mount. Look with me at chapter 7, verses 15 and following of the book of Matthew. It reads, Beware of the false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. Grapes are not gathered from thorn bushes, nor figs from thistles, are they? So every good tree bears good fruit, but the bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So then, you will know them by their fruits. You remember this? Anyone remember the name that accompanies this face? That's right, it's Mr. Yuck. And parents would place stickers of Mr. Yuck on everything poisonous in the house as a warning for youngsters to stay away. Well, Jesus is playing the role of Mr. Yuck here in this passage. He's warning his audience of the poisonous nature of false prophets. They are toxic. So you must be careful not to ingest what they are trying to feed you. Now, Jesus isn't playing around here. This is serious stuff. The Messiah has come, but the influencers will say that he hasn't. The religious leaders will mask error with truth. These blind guides neglect the weightier matters of the law. The scribes and the Pharisees honor God with their lips, but their heart is far from him. Jesus not only labels them false prophets, but he also refers to these religious heretics as blind guides, brood of vipers, whitewashed tombs, and hypocrites. Jesus exposes their true identity. He plays the part of Mr. Yuck in an effort to steer people away from these ravenous wolves, as he calls them. But here's the thing about ravenous wolves. They don't always look like ravenous wolves. Sometimes they wear a disguise. Sometimes they're incognito. Sometimes they look just like you and me. You don't hang a beware of dog sign on a fishbowl. Aquarium fish aren't scary. You can see them swimming around. They pose no threat. Even if they did, they can't go anywhere or do anything. They're in a fishbowl. They're trapped with no arms or legs. The subtlety is what makes these false prophets so scary because they blend in with the crowd. They look like sheep. They smell like sheep. They bleat like sheep. But they also eat the sheep. There's an old fable by Aesop about a wolf that wanted to catch some sheep to eat, but he was unable to do so because the shepherds were watching the flock so closely. Well, one night the wolf found an old sheepskin that had been cast aside, and so the wolf dressed himself in the sheepskin and went into the pasture where the sheep were grazing. A little unsuspecting lamb started following the wolf in sheep's clothing. The wolf took advantage of the situation and ate the little lamb. But that evening, the wolf entered the fold with the rest of the flock. It just so happened that the shepherd was making some mutton broth and needed a sheep to slaughter, so he went into the fold and caught the first sheep he found. Turns out the sheep he ended up slaughtering was actually the wolf in disguise. The false teacher will eventually be brought to light. He can't hide forever. But he can get away with leading many people away from the flock and down the broad path. And that's why Jesus' warning is so stern and so serious. It would be one thing if someone were to preach a message about how there is no God and that Abraham was merely a fictional character and Moses just dreamed up the Torah. None of that ever really happened. The people of Jesus' day would have certainly pushed back on some teaching like that. These would have been brazen heresies. They would have recognized that they were false teachings. It's kind of like the old cartoon of the wolf and the sheepdog. Remember these? The two of them would clock in and exchange pleasantries. Morning, Sam. Morning, Ralph. The wolf would then spend the day trying to steal the sheep while the sheepdog would beat the pulp out of him for trying to do so. It would all end with the two of them back at the time clock, clocking out, exchanging pleasantries, and doing it all over again the next day. 
Sam the Sheepdog and Ralph the Wolf had obvious roles that were clearly defined, and it wasn't hard to discern which was which. But the same cannot always be said for false prophets. Now, before we go any further, let's be clear about the term prophet and thus what constitutes a false prophet. I mean, let me ask you, what comes to mind when you hear the word prophet? Someone who predicts the future? I mean, that's often what we think of when we hear the word prophet. But when you read through Scripture, especially the Old Testament, you find that prophets didn't primarily predict what would happen. They mostly interpreted what was happening. They didn't only deal with future events. They often dealt with current events. The main question a prophet was tasked with answering wasn't so much what's going to happen, but rather, why is this happening? I've heard prophets described as foretellers and forthtellers. They define the present moment, which is foretelling, but they also paint a picture of the future, which is foretelling. Prophets of God often dealt with the why of the moment. The people would cry out, why is this happening to us? And the prophet would go to God, then interpret the events of the day and explain what they needed to do in order to avoid destruction. So whenever there was a drought, a famine, an earthquake, a plague, or some other sort of disaster, the people would cry out to God for answers to the questions. And the biggest question was why? And God would send a prophet to make sense of the devastation. This is the distinguishing characteristic between a true prophet and a false prophet. A true prophet delivered God's explanation of the situation, while a false prophet made his own interpretation of the situation. False prophets have ulterior motives. They are only in it for themselves. The false prophet would claim to know why things were happening and how to correct it, but the proof was always in the pudding. Notice Deuteronomy chapter 18, starting verse 20, it reads, But the prophet who speaks a word presumptuously in my name, a word which I have not commanded him to speak, or which he speaks in the name of other gods, that prophet shall die. And if you say in your heart, how will we recognize the word which the Lord has not spoken? When the prophet speaks in the name of the Lord and the thing does not happen or come true, that is the thing which the Lord has not spoken. The prophet has spoken it presumptuously. You are not to be afraid of him. So how do you distinguish between a true prophet and a false one? Well, by the results. Did it happen the way they predicted? If not, then you know it, it wasn't a message from God. Peter alluded to this in 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 20 and 21. There it reads, But know this, first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture becomes a matter of someone's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever made by an act of human will, but men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. Again, you evaluate a prophet based on the origin of their message. Where did it come from? Did it come from God or just their own imagination? The true prophet will be moved by the Holy Spirit because no true prophecy comes off the top of someone's head. Now, there's no shortage of false prophets today, and I'm not talking religiously, although there are some of those as well, but it's a, it's a good time to be a false prophet in our culture. Today's most brazen heretic will be given a hearing and in all likelihood, a book deal, a podcast, a TV show. I mean, there's more tolerance for those who subvert the truth than there is for those who boldly defend it. We're encouraged, even bullied at times, to bear patiently with any amount of error. Some would even say that by doing so, we are Im imitating Jesus. In the ancient world, there were numerous spiritual messages. Now, if you wanted to gain a following, just go out and tell people that you have a message from God about their situation. Just claim that God gave you a revelation about how to make one's problems disappear and you would likely gain a following. And today it's different. Our world isn't as religious, but that doesn't mean that there's a shortage of prophets. Secular prophets dot the landscape, speaking to the current climate as well as the future. They seek to educate us on why bad things are happening, instruct us on what to do in light of these bad things that are happening, and predict what terrible fate will endure if we refuse to listen. And it's not just the far left or the far right. It's both and all points in between. There are people who claim to speak with authority and place themselves in the seat of a prophet. They're not merely giving their opinion or commentary on what's going on. They're confidently asserting that they know why the world is the way that it is and how the world will turn out if we don't do something. And whether we're talking about secular prophets or religious prophets, the tool of discernment is the same. Jesus says you will know them by their fruits. You want to know if someone's message is true versus toxic? Look at what their message produces because the proof is in the fruit. 
You know, I thought about bringing a piece of fruit with me this morning. I was going to bring an orange and, uh, and ask you what it was, and you would say an orange, and I'd say, no, it's an apple. Uh, actually, that would have been funny, but I didn't do that this morning. Uh, I was going to bring an orange, and there are three things that are true about an orange, right? It's visible. I know that. I mean, it's obvious, but it's important to know that fruit is visible. Fruit is always visible, whether we're talking about an orange or the fruit that you produce in your life. Invisible fruit is worthless. You don't go shopping for invisible fruit. You see fruit. You can see that you love Jesus, but, but it's, it's seen in your actions, right? In the things that you do. If you were accused of being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict you? Or would you be innocent of all charges? Can people see that you are fruity? Secondly, fruit always bears the character of the tree from which it came. I mean, if I had an orange here, I would ask, you know, what kind of tree produces oranges? And you would say an orange tree, right? Grapevines don't produce oranges. Apple trees don't produce pears. Pineapples don't grow on plum trees. The nature of the tree defines the fruit. Jesus said it this way, grapes are not gathered from thorn bushes nor figs from thistles, are they? So the answer to Jesus' question is an obvious no because fruit is defined by the fruit, by the tree, I should say, that it came from. And therefore, when we're attached to the vine, we produce fruit that is defined by Christ. Our attachment to Jesus produces character that looks like Jesus. We reflect that character of the vine. And the third thing that is true about an orange, and all fruit for that matter, is that fruit never exists for itself. The only fruit that exists for itself is rotten fruit. Fruit exists so that someone else can partake of it. That is the purpose of fruit. Which means that if no one wants to take a bite out of your life, if no one finds your fruit appetizing, then something in your life is rotten. There, these are the characteristics of fruit, right? Fruit is visible. Fruit always bears the character of the tree from which it came, and fruit never exists for itself. So when we examine our lives, we're doing a fruit inspection. We're looking ourselves over to make sure that we're producing good quality fruit. And perhaps you're thinking, well, Chris, what are you suggesting? Are you saying that I may be a bad tree producing bad fruit and thus I'm a false prophet? Well, here's what I'm saying. I'm saying that you cannot afford to be naive. Don't think it can't happen to you. Sometimes the bad fruit is growing in your own backyard. It's not just the false prophet that's producing rotten fruit. Many times the rotten fruit shows up in our own lives. And that brings me to a question. Who are your prophets? Who are you listening to? Who has your ear? And what is their message? If you want to know if someone is proclaiming a message from God or from their own corrupt heart, just look at what the message is producing in you, in your life. Who or what is shaping you? What is making you, you? I know of people who love God, but they're producing bad fruit because they're listening to messages that sound good. The message may even be mostly right, but it's a message that's producing rotten results. It's a message about how bad the world is, how we can make it right, and how everything will end up in the toilet if we don't do something. I have friends who listen to this message, and it gets them all riled up. It causes them anxiety. It gets them angry. They lash out at others who don't see it the same way as they do. They get on Facebook and become ambassadors of hate. They act in grossly unchristlike ways, all because they listen to a messenger on Fox News or CNN or political talk radio. That message brought fame and fortune to the one delivering it, but it brought fear and frustration to the one listening to it. The messenger had their ear, and soon he had their heart. Now, please understand, I, I'm not chastising anyone for keeping up with the news or having a vested interest in politics, but if such messages are causing you to produce rotten fruit, then you better turn off the TV, turn off the radio, throw out the newspaper, and open up the Bible and let the voice of God be the loudest in your life. Any messenger with a message that produces bad fruit in your life must be cut off. Put your fingers in your ears because you've got way more important things to listen to and way more important things to proclaim. The people of Jesus' day had no shortage of false prophets. They had plenty of people willing to give their commentary on the status of the world. Here's why this is happening, and here's what you need to do would be the message. Here's why the Messiah hasn't come. Anyone who wants to know the truth, just come and follow me, they would say. And there were countless individuals and groups selling their self-proclaimed truth. And what was the result? What fruits were produced from these false messages? Well, 
jealousy, rage, murder. I mean, they crucified the Son of God. How in the world could the covenant people of God miss the true message of Scripture? How could God's chosen people have been so blind? How did the Jews completely miss the message of the prophets? How could their hearts have become so hard and so full of corruption? How could they have missed the Messiah? I'll tell you how. Two words. False prophets. These false teachers proclaimed a message that produced rotten fruit in the lives of those who ingested it. If you have your Bibles, look with me at Galatians chapter 5. And beginning in verse 16, we read this. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. For the desire of the flesh is against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. For these are in opposition to one another in order to keep you from doing whatever you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the deeds of the flesh are evident, which are sexual immorality, impurity, indecent behavior, idolatry, witchcraft, hostilities, strife, jealousy, outburst of anger, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these, of which I forewarn you, just as I have forewarned you, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. You know, if you're not listening to the Spirit, then you're not walking by the Spirit, and thus you're not producing the fruit of the Spirit. You know what you're producing? Rotten fruit, sexual immorality, outbursts of anger, envy, selfish ambition, etc. When God doesn't have your ear and the Spirit doesn't have your heart, it's going to show up in your life. Who you listen to is who you follow, and who you follow will determine the course of your life. Therefore, we need to listen and be led by the Spirit and not the flesh. Keep reading in Galatians 5, verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Now those who belong to Christ, Jesus, crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. The Spirit produces fruit of the highest quality. When you walk by the Spirit, when you listen to the Spirit, it will manifest itself in your character and your contribution. And here's something else. Intimacy produces fruit. Remember these words from Jesus? I am the vine, you are the branches. The one who remains in me and I in him bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not remain in me, he is thrown away like a branch and dries up. And they gather them and throw them into the fire and they are burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. My Father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. Being with Jesus will produce certain things in your life. And you say, well, what's that, Chris? Well, things like humility, meekness, mercy, loving your enemies, going the extra mile, turning the other cheek, treating others the same way you want to be treated, walking the narrow way. All the things that Jesus mentions in this Sermon on the Mount. We stated it last week. Jesus is wrapping up his sermon as we get to chapter 7. And this is the so what part of the lesson. Jesus is saying, so what are you going to do about it? Any preacher worth his salt is going to ask the question and answer the question for his audience. So what? What are you going to do with everything? So what does this have to do with me? How is this going to help me be a better disciple? How is this going to help me get to heaven? And Jesus is asking and answering, so what? What are you going to do with everything I've just told you? It's an invitation from Jesus. Are you going to follow me down the narrow path? Or are you going to follow these false prophets down the broad road? You want to produce fruit of excellent quality? Well, then don't listen to the religious leaders. Don't give them your ear. Listen to me, because I won't lead you astray, and I will give you the best life, Jesus says. You know, smoke alarms have been around for a long time, but did you know that they're not as effective on kids? Since most kids are sound sleepers, the loud, piercing shrill of a smoke alarm doesn't typically arouse them from their sleep. So to combat this, there are now smoke alarms on the market that instead of using a piercing screech, they use mom's voice. The mother of the child can record her voice saying something like, get up, get up, there's a fire. Studies have shown that children on average can take up to five minutes to wake up from the wail of a smoke alarm. While the sound of mom's voice prompted the child to be up and out of the house in an average of 18 to 28 seconds. In other words, 
this tactic has proven to be three times more effective than the normal alarm sound. Folks, there are a multitude of alarming voices competing for your attention, but there's only one that is worthy to have your ear. He's saying, get up, follow me. Are you listening? And my friends, we have evidence from the Old Testament of what happens when you don't allow the voice of God to be the loudest in your life. All this mess that you see in the world around you, all the turmoil and the tribulation and the trials, you can thank your parents for that. Not your earthly parents, but your former parents that lived in the garden, that lived in paradise, Adam and Eve. They started all this because they allowed the voice of a serpent to be the loudest in your life. You remember that story? God told them not to eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. They could eat from any other tree, just not that one. And they disobeyed God. Eve allowed a serpent to have her ear. She allowed that serpent to slither up into her life and convince her that it was okay. That's what happens when you allow uh, another voice to be the loudest in your life. So we go back to our original question. Who are you listening to? Who has your ear? Hopefully you're listening to the Word of God. You're in the Bible daily, studying, hearing what God has to say. The big question that we have to answer when we read through Scripture is what is God saying? Not what do I want God to say, but what is God saying? And we've got to allow what He is saying to humbly trouble us. There are things in the Bible, and I'm sure you've noticed this, there are things in the Bible that we may tend to not agree with, or maybe that we are alarmed by, and we say, really? I mean, based on culture and the things going on around us, that doesn't sound right. But listen, God's Word is timeless. It's transcendent. And it's certainly going to speak against much of what is going on in our culture. So you've got competing voices here. You've got the voice and voices in the world around us, or you've got the one voice that is God. Listen to Him. Allow Him to lead you and guide you. Let His voice be the loudest in your life and seek to live out His will in all that you do. Thank you so much for tuning in to the Dear Church Podcast. I want you to know that if you have a question or a comment, you can contact me at chris.mccurley at rippleoflight.com. We appreciate you so much for tuning in. Until next time, may the Lord bless you and keep you sincerely, Chris.